We wake up here with kings in the big blind, playing in a 100 here, one, two, three, four, seven handed. And action starts. We get one under the gun open raiser, three and a half times a big blind. All right, and this guy, I'm always looking at his stats. Um, early position, open raise at 13%, middle position already at 43%. <laughs> um, relatively small in of 140 hands, as you see here. Um, let's see what he's running. Yeah, so, hmm, looking like a loose, aggressive kind of player, stealing a lot. Um, so, yeah, anyways, he's raising up 13% of the time. Play continues. We get one cold caller and an over cold caller. Okay, so open raise, cold caller, over cold caller. Chris lets it go, and we make a three bet. Okay, so it's a three bet from the big blind. This is not a steal situation because there was an open raising. So steal again is a positional move pre-flop when it's folded around to either the cutoff or the button or the small blind and they make an open raise. So this is just a, a normal situation where you have an open raiser, cold callers, actually two cold callers, and we then three bet from the big blind and we just pop it to 14. It's enough. Uh, the open raiser is only getting 30 percent, right? Uh, 2.3 or 2.4 to 1 odds to make that call and we have an exceedingly strong hand. So, yeah, we make it 14, and that's how it goes down here after the fact. We get one caller, so this guy open raise calls, this guy over calls, and then calls the three bet. So, our kings here are in trouble if an ace hits, for sure. And luckily for us, it doesn't. Now, let's look at this flop here. We've got 46 big blinds in the middle, and the three remaining players are all still relatively deep. This guy, our big stack, this guy's actually deep stacked at 130 big blinds. Look at the pot, the pot to stack ratios. This is always something you want to keep in mind, guys. This is about two thirds of his stack. Okay, it's about half my stack. And it's about one third of this guy's stack, say. Okay, it's not exact, but you know, just eyeball it and there you go. So that means that this guy bets half pot into here, right? He's pretty much committed if anybody calls on any given turn. So his scenario here is, you know, uh, you, you can make that you can make that play, hoping to take it down. But if you think you're going to be outplayed after the fact or committed on the turn, especially if somebody makes a, uh, if this guy makes a C-bet here, which is a decent sized C-bet, he doesn't necessarily just need to be calling. It's, it's normally a push or fold scenario for this guy here at that stack size. We then flop this enormous flop. We've got an over pair plus the second nut flush draw, plus a gut, a gut shot draw. Even if somebody's flopped a kind of a funky flush, say. Uh, say they call with 7-8 suited. This guy here, uh, in position, over called, then called again with a 7-8 suited club. We've still got uh, a lot of outs with our hand uh, coming into this. But we actually don't think we're on a draw. We think we have the best hand, and that's how it goes down. So we go ahead and bet it out strong. Right, we don't want the bare ace of clubs hanging out and sucking out on us um, if another club does happen to hit. Uh, we got a lot of we got a lot of equity here against most of these guys' ranges, and I believe we take it down just straight. No, okay, we get one call. So okay, again, this guy's call is half of his stack, right? And you guys remember the adage: anytime you're putting in half your stack. You're not pushing, or you're not calling. You're either pushing or folding, and that's exactly what he should have done. So, if he had the bare ace, I mean, he should come over the top for sure. Um, I'll be calling at this point, of course, anything um, for the remainder of his stack. And yeah, the bare ace should have pushed. You know, set of nine, set of jacks, set of queens, two pair. All of those hands need to push right now against this kind of scenario. And I might myself be on the bare ace, say. Um, ace 10 um, offsuit whatever uh, trying to make a trying to make a light three bet here from the big blind uh, squeeze so you know everything's possible but in this scenario here with this stack size given this pot size and my bet right this is not a uh, call then fold the turn scenario this is a push fold right now on the flop that'll save you guys a lot of money in the long run just keeping that in mind So there's a seven, and of course I push. Right, it's, the pot is now already twice, even over twice my size, or my stack size, and uh, three times his. 
So, yeah, I push everything, and he should have, of course, known that coming into this turn. So, I mean, if he wanted to play on again, push fold on the flop. That's what it was. And this guy actually just, <laughs> you know, we can only thank him for it. Um, you know, he actually called and then folded and hold him replay gave him the dice, which means he's a gambler. And you see that with a 33% V pip and an 8% preflop raise. So, yeah, we take down a really decent sized pot with that positional uh, move from the big blind. So basically squeezing open raiser and then two over callers. Okay, so here, ace king suited on the button. Already positioned raiser with tens. We're both big stacked. One caller. And here I just make, I think, a, kind of a weak three bit. Yeah. Um, so this squeeze was way too light with ace king. Um, you can you can do this from time to time when you are on the button. Just build the pot up uh, with less than yeah, the suggested bet size. Hopefully get some callers, hit the flop hard, and then play on when both of you guys, uh, or actually all three players, are deep stacked. That's feasible. Again, textbook would be right uh, three times um, three times the open raiser, so nine plus the three. Right, 12. You could even throw in the big blind if you wanted to for 13, and that would have been the typical, uh, the typical squeeze scenario: open raiser, cold caller, three bet squeezing the initial raiser. All right, and of course we get at least one call, um, and we miss big time. So, no, no draw for the flush. No draw for uh, okay back door. Uh, backdoor straight draw, I guess, but that's just not going to happen a lot, and this guy uh, flops an under pair, so paired board, he checks it to us, we have the initiative, and we bet half pot, yeah, so we whiff completely, in a scenario where we make a C bet with air for half pot size, a little over, and that means he needs to fold 33% of the time, and he's folding... Uh, yeah, 57%. I think it's actually out of the viewing area. So 57% on two bet flops and or in two bet pots and 50% um, of the time there on three bet po uh, flops or three <laughs> three bet pots, which this was. So very good. So we bet half pot and he check calls. Okay, nine comes. He checks and now we have the option to fire a second barrel. Okay, still nothing, still playing air here, and we've got our two over cards draw, of course, we don't know what he's holding, and the pot is now 39.5 big blinds. He checks again. So, you have the option here to check behind, you know, hope for that king of that ace, right, and that's the power of playing in position as a preflop aggressor. And so you've got everything, again, open in the world, play in position as often as possible. So we can fire a second barrel here, uh, and at this point, you know, you want to make that you know, at least 25 um, to go and take down the pot right there. And he should be able to let that go, actually. But I just take the free card, and we end up hitting the king on the on the river. So basically, what happened was, with that with that positional bet, with that C bet on the flop in position, right for 10, I get two cards for the price of one, which means essentially. Okay, so I'm you know I'm getting the full 25% equity from my move here. So two cards for the price of one, and I can take it down right here a lot. And that's the power of the C bet in position again, guys. He calls us. Turn comes. I opt for check behind. So my move was C bet the flop, check behind the turn. Let's say my line was, and the king hits. And this would be a good spot for him, matter of fact, to make a so-called block bet. So block bets, as we had mentioned, is when you bet, you know, half to maybe even just one third of the pot size. So maybe you could throw out 15 here, representing either the king, um, you know, 10 queen, representing the jack itself, um, yeah, even the full. But you know, given this check, check, check call business, probably not so likely. But what he's going to do is also bet that same or similar amount at 15 to 20 when um, he's betting for value. Right, so that's the idea of a block bet. Um, we're both still relatively, he's super deep and I'm still big stacked. So when he bets at 15 into this pot, you know, I, I have a good chance of folding if I missed um, or if I put him on the jack. And if I raise, he can, of course, let it go. So it's the idea of a block bet. 
he could have done that. He opts in for a check again. And when he does check, I make a value bet. All right. So his check call move, check call, check call on the turn, on the flop in the turn will often induce me to bluff here. So his his line of play could also be a bluff induce. So that's a long ball bluff induce where he let's say he did actually flop the jack. He check called it, check called the turn, right? Or just say check I uh, check the turn that I check behind and then he very bravely checks the river again hoping that I'm going to bluff into this pot when he does actually hold the jack. All right. Um it's called a bluff induce. That could have been something that he was playing, but uh, I didn't put him on the jack, so I go ahead and make this bet for value. And here I'm either way ahead or way behind. So if he comes over the top, I'm going to let that go probably seven times out of ten. Right, his check raise on the river is never, and he's had an in a four, so four times to do so. Um, and yeah, he's only getting to the showdown 22% of the time, and so a check raise here is going to raise me right out of my seat very often. But again, the idea of a value bet is you know you have a beatable hand, very beatable hand, and you bet into the pot anyways to increase your value. And uh, this could potentially be seen as a marginal hand given given the play here. Yeah, so that's how it went down, and I bet the 26, and he goes ahead and calls because that was the line that he was playing was this um, yeah this bluff induced kind of line all the way to the river. Alright, he just calls down and we take it down.